So today, uh, Earth Day 2016, we're very lucky to have uh, Luis de Hoyos, the director of the Academy Award winning film uh, The Cove, to talk about his latest film, uh, Racing Extinction. It's an honor to have you here, Louis. How are you? How are you doing today? Uh, good, good. I just uh, I came from Tribeca Film Festival just a few minutes ago. Just came, but we I got something called the Disruptor Award, which is you know, back when I was a kid, you called you know it was an award for being a troublemaker. But uh, it was it was exciting because there were like a few thousand people there, and I was just uh, you know, and the people there were there to celebrate people that are trying to change the world with film, and you know, I mean, guy from the start of Charity Water, a lot of different organizations. I just felt like, uh, well, as we did this little bit building. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty good. You're actually from New York originally, right? I lived, I lived here, but I'm from Chelsea originally. I used to live up at uh, 23rd between 10th and 11th Avenue back when um, this was a really bad neighborhood. <laughs> I mean, it was, uh, the, the, the selling point when I got my place was uh, from the landlord. He said, you, from this window, you can see a crime an hour. <laughs> and I thought that was really cool. This is back when I was your age in my 20s, and I thought that those were pretty exciting. Then um, I, I was working at National Geographic at that point, and then I um, started uh, an organization called the Oceanic Preservation Society, and I, I moved recently a little bit closer to the ocean. Hmm. So you're not in Denver anymore? Uh, I used to be in Boulder. I was in Boulder for about 25 years. Oh, and wow. we used to, So I was running the Oceanic Preservation Society from Boulder, and that we used to say we're conveniently located between two oceans. <laughs> but uh, now, in the last six months, I moved out to Northern California. Oh, okay, nice. Based out of there. So what, uh, brought you, what brought you from um, doing photography for National Geographic to filmmaking? Mm. Um, a, oh, a friend of mine, this will probably be interesting to the tech people here, but uh, a, a good friend of mine that was the, my dive buddy was uh, Jim Clark. The guy that started Netscape, Silicon Graphics, WebMD. Netscape was the first commercial internet browser. I photographed him for Fortune magazine. I, I used to be a photographer in a former life. And I photographed him when he had built this, this big boat called Hyperion, had the world's tallest mast. And we, hung, we were hanging out in Amsterdam where the boat was being launched and found out we both liked to dive. And uh, you know, he said, Louis, would you teach me how to be a good photographer? And I said, Jim, I'll teach you how to be a great one if you teach me how to be a billionaire. And so he would pick me up, you know, on his, on his plane, and we would go around the world and go to the, some of the most, most amazing places in the world, places I could, I could never have done on my own. And we, you know, I taught him photography. We just explored. And uh, this is the third time we are in the Galapagos, and there was fishermen illegally long lying in a marine sanctuary, you know, all around us. And, I, and Jim said, somebody should do something about this. And I said, how about you and I? And he said, what do you mean? And he said, uh, we'll use your money in my eye and we'll make films. And I thought that was, you know, to me, that was, I, that was, I always wanted to be a filmmaker. I'd worked for National Geographic as a still photographer, but it wasn't my area of expertise. And so, I, you know, he was going to fund me for, uh, you know, about a million dollars a year, which was a you know, hefty amount of money. It was a good amount of money for a you know, documentary filmmaker. And, but I'd never made a film before in my life. And so now uh, we're on vacation together down in the Caribbean, and my kid is playing on the beach with uh, another kid whose father is a pretty well-known film director. And Steven Spielberg comes over to the boat and says, uh, uh, you know, I, I said to him, uh, Mr. Spielberg, do you have any advice for a first-time filmmaker? He said, yeah, never make a movie involving any boats, boats or animals. Now, the first <laughs> film I did was The Cove, which became the most winning documentary in history. It won, like, I don't know, over 70 top film awards from Sundance to the Academy Award. Um, but that was our, our first film. But the, uh, the idea was, if, did, did, anybody, did people here see The Cove? A couple? Yeah, so about half the people. Another half probably heard of it, or they're, then they're scared to see it. Because uh, <laughs> it has the stigma as being like a really violent film. And it has one section in it that is pretty, uh, it's hard, for, hard to watch. It was hard for me to make. Uh, we had planted hidden cameras in this place where they kill more dolphins than any place in the world. This is where they supply, um, in this place in, in Taiji, Japan, they, um, they kill several thousand dolphins a year, and the ones they're looking for young females uh, that they put into service in the, in the captive dolphin industry. Most, most of the swim with dolphin parks in Asia and Europe and you know, come out of this one little cove. And we, th we saw, what, how do they kill these animals? What do they do with them? And we planted these hidden cameras. And it sort of uh, became like a James Bond movie. You know, the, the whole film sort of took a turn when we decided to sneak into this cove, and it became really exciting. It wasn't just a documentary anymore. It was like a, you know, uh, I think Rolling Stone called the movie a cross between the Bourne Identity and Flipper. 
and it was, you know, it was exciting. We had some amazing footage that came out of there. But here's the really cool thing about the film, aside from all the awards and the, you know, that that we got from doing that one film, is that they were killing 23,000 dolphins and porpoises a year in Japan when we started that movie. Now they're killing less than 6,000, mostly because of that movie. Because uh, in the movie we explain that, you know, how they're killed, and we also explain that these all these animals are toxic. Yeah, a, a dolphin a day, because of the, the the ocean is so polluted by what we put into it, they. If you have, for those of you who haven't seen the movie or don't remember the movie, if you saw it, uh, there's six levels of the food chain in the ocean from plankton up to, to dolphins. And at every tropic level, each one of those tropic levels, there's an order of magnitude more pollution. So uh, a pound of swordfish or a pound of dolphin flesh has a, a million times more pollutants in it than a pound of plankton because it all gets magnified, magnified up the food chain. So to the point where a dolphin being washing up on the co coast of New York State right now, has about you know six thousand uh, parts of um, you know uh, PCBs in it. That would be eligible for a, for a, uh, a Superfund site. Just that one dolphin. So and now people in Japan are eating this. And so just by you know t telling people, giving the information that the government wasn't giving, because you go to the Minister of Health's website in Japan, full, they had advisories for women to be eating dolphin meat, even though it's toxic. One one piece of toxic dolphin meat could be enough to maybe make your fetus abort. And so now th those numbers drop precipitously. And I mean, I'll just steamroll right into the next idea. So I'm at Sundance with, this, with, with the Cove as their first as our premiere. And my, back, my own background is that when I worked at National Geographic, I did stories on the Mesozoic, the midlife of the planet. This is the age of dinosaurs. And you know, I've dug up dinosaurs all around the world. I did a book on dinosaurs called hunting dinosaurs, and they use basically 50 of the top paleontologists in the world as tour guides through the Mesozoic. So I know a bit about this subject. I spent 10 years working in that world. But at Sundance, I brought uh, a, f a book to, uh, with me by, it was called Terra by Michael Novacek, the head provost of the American Museum of Natural History up at 81st in Columbus. And in the book, he's talking about how we're losing species now faster than mankind's ability to record that these animals are even on the planet with us. And I thought, this is horrific. You know, and I didn't want, that's not the headspace I wanted to be in when I'm showing the premiere on my film. So I picked up the only other book I brought with me, but this is by Charles Verone, a former chief marine scientist for Australia. And in the book, he's talking about we're losing the Great Barrier Reef now and all other reefs on the planet because of acidification. That's exactly what goes on before a mass extinction event. That's what we're going through right now. And I thought, here I'm running this organization called the Oceanic Preservation Society. I consider myself a, a lay expert in this field, and I had no idea that we were losing the oceans that quick. I had no idea we were in the middle of the mass, ex you know, what scientists are calling the Anthropocene, the age of man. This is a, an epoch where we are leaving a mark on the fossil record of the future to the point that future generations can see that there's a line. When we arrived, they're probably not going to be, they'll be looking at the computers in the garbage dump. And they're, but they're going to see, like, it's a, it could be like an iridium later, you know, when the comet hit uh, the dinosaur 65 million years ago wiped out all the large dinosaurs. It was left with an iridium layer. And so anything, uh, there's not dinosaurs above that iridium layer, uh, but there's uh, dinosaurs below it. So we know that there was a, a, a catastrophic event. When future generations look back at the equivalent of the iridium layer, they're going to see our, our garbage. And I think that if we don't do a great job at trying to mitigate this problem, you know, we're not going to be looking and say how great our computers are, how great our technology is, how wonderful it is that we can communicate at the speed of light across the planet. They're going to say that this generation presided over the biggest apocalypse on the planet since the, dinosaur, since the dinosaurs uh, were wiped out by a comet 65 million years ago. And, but the, so it, it just shocked me at, at Sundance to realize that we were in the, in the middle of this epoch that I was oblivious to. Because when, when you're digging dinosaurs around the planet, you know, you're looking around at these graveyards, like in the Gobi Desert with Michael Novacek, and you're fine, you can you almost trip over dinosaurs. And you think, what happened here? What went on? And, you know, it's, you know, sandstorms and all this cataclysmic stuff, and the iridium layer is pretty easy to, to spot it. But to think that we're going through an event like that right now, because we're, this is comfortable, we're all having lunch, we're, it's air-conditioned air, we can communicate on our, on our phones, and, you know, at the speed of light, uh, thoughts that we might have, but to the natural world, to the rest of the planet, we're just one species.
there's, we don't even know by an order of magnitude how many, how many animals we're, we're sharing it with, but we know we're losing faster than we record that they're here. Some people say at eight and a half, 10 million. We've only identified about a million and a half species out of a whole catalog of maybe eight, 30 million, 100 million species. We don't even know. So I look at things, because of uh, hanging around paleontologists, I look at things a little bit different. They, they have an appreciation of what's called deep time, where you know the guys that I'm digging up dinosaurs with, they're not looking at, you know, they're not thinking about they might be thinking about lunch, but they're also thinking about what the animals that they, they're digging in, how did they fit into this whole history of life? And now as a photographer and a filmmaker, I'm trying to think of how do you make a film about perhaps the most cataclysmic event in the world that nobody knows about, but give them a sense of hope after they see the film. Like there's something that we can do. I, said, I, I don't want to just make a film about, you know, like a Nova film, which are, which are really well produced, but don't give you tangible ideas of what you can do to change it. Because if this is a, a planetary disaster on the scale that you know, is unpre unprecedented, you, sh you can't be just you know, saying that the house is burning down. You have to say, what, you know, what can you do to get buckets of water on it? So that's, uh, that was racing extinction. But the film, I knew that yeah, when you do a, you know, a normal Hollywood film, you know, it's, they, they look at you, the audience, as $10 in a box of popcorn. You know, you're just butts in seats. And I don't look like I don't look at filmmaking, documentary filmmaking, like that. I look at you as minds and seats, and more importantly, minds and hearts and seats, because the science shows that people don't change behavior on what they learn, what they what they what they think. You have to change their heart first. You can talk about thirty thousand species dying every day, and people. It's just a a calculation. That's a number. It's a statistic. But early in the film, Racing Extinction, we show this scene. Uh, I went up. To, oh, I, I'm not sure. You, you might want to direct this a little bit more. You can stop me anytime <laughs> you want. But the, in the beginning of this film, I find a buoy on a beach. Uh, it was down in down in the uh, uh, Dominican Republic, and this fisherman had brought. The, the, you know, said, uh, "You guys are from America. Can you reach, you know give me five hundred dollars as a five hundred dollar reward for this for this buoy?" And I said, "Just a minute. Let me see what this, you know, where's, what this buoy looks like." And it was a big thing. And not too easy to carry back up to America, but it was actually owned by a friend of mine, uh, Chris Clark from the Cornell Bioacoustical Laboratory. He runs the biggest um, repository of animal sounds on the planet. And after I returned this buoy, he, he tells me, Louis, just about everything on the, the planet's been singing, we just haven't been listening. We're losing these voices. He plays for me the voice of, a, of an OO. This is a, a, a bird from Hawaii, Kauai, uh, the, the small island of Kauai in the Hawaiian Islands. And he's th these. He tells me that these birds mate for life. And uh, they a, a duetting pair, where he'll sing, and then she answers with a, sing in the, uh, with a song in the forest. And that's a, it's a beautiful duet. But he's only playing me the male side of the duet. And there's a gap where the female should be. And he says, you know why? He says, that's the last male of a species singing for a female that'll never come. That breaks my heart. And it should break everybody's heart because you can identify. That's it's no longer just one of thirty thousand species, some number. It's like you can identify with that one animal. You know, that's like the, you know the Martian, the film that came out. You know, there's a whole film based on you know one guy's survive trying to get to survive. But you can imagine where there's no hope for this bird. There's you know Michael Novacek was saying to, to me that after I you know came came back and interviewed him, he said. Uh, he was doing a dissertation. He, it was, I had five grad students doing their, their dissertations, and three of them were doing uh, dissertations on the birds of Hawaii. Uh, I think like five of the birds went extinct in the three-year period that they were working on the papers. I mean, that's how fast things are, are disappearing. So uh, to, to me, it's like really crucial to make a movie, to get it out there at, you know, at light speed so people can start you know, getting their heart changed because the solutions which we can talk about later, are, are really fairly simple. There's, you know, uh, you know, five major drivers of, of extinction. There's habitat destruction, pollution, pollution invasive species, overconsumption. I just said four. I can't remember the fifth one. But we try to address them all in the movie. Uh, but the idea is that the biggest problem with, uh, with, with extinction is habitat destruction. And that's because we're tearing down rainforests, we're tearing down natural habitat to grow food for animals that we're going to eat. And it's, if, you know, you guys are engineers, you're, you're thought leaders. Now think about this. If you had a pile of grain on the table, 
and you had to give, you, you could either eat that yourself to get your protein and your nutrition, or you could give six times that amount to an animal that you're in turn going to eat so you can get its flesh. It's a really bad exchange of energy, but that's what we're doing all over the planet. You know, um, there's, a, there's a really dangerous myth that we need meat for human consumption. You know, we think, oh, to be a man, to be strong, you have to, you know, you have to eat that way. You have to eat an animal. Well, in fact, the next movie I'm working on, it's called Game Changes. It's being directed, uh, being uh, executive produced by James and Susie Cameron from, from Avatar. And um, one of the heroes in our movie is a guy that won the ultimate, this is a documentary, by the way. It's a, he was a, uh, an ultimate fighting champion, and he got injured. He thought, well, what can I do for nutrition? What's the best way? What can I eat to heal myself? And found there's very little information out there on that. Most doctors, you do 14 years of, of uh, medical, you know, learning to be a doctor, but not have a single hour in your curriculum of, of nutrition. And, but he found out that the, you know, the gladiators, which were the first sort of ultimate fighting champions, were actually vegans. They didn't eat meat. You know, these two professors from Austria, who we just interviewed last month, I went in and they looked at the strontium levels and the, the, the teeth and the bones, and they could determine that, in fact, they were, they were not you know, meat eaters, they were vegetarians, they were vegans. They were, in fact, they were called the barley men. You know, so that when they go back into the documentation, they found out that was uh, one of the concoctions that they, they ate for protein. It's a very recent myth that you have to eat animals for human consumption. We've just been, you know, sold a bill of goods about all this. It's, you know, if you look at your teeth, or if you have cats or dogs, go back and look at their dentition. You know, they're carnivores. But it, it, the, the back molars are, there's no back molars, but they have very pointy, sharp teeth with serrations that are used for gulping meat and it goes into a very short digestive tract. And, but we have, you know, incisors here that are to, used to like crunch through an avocado or, or a piece of fruit. And these molars are used to crush, you know, beans, legumes, vegetables. You know, we're, a prim we, we're omnivores, but our gut tract and our teeth is all about being a vegetarian. Um, sort of fast forwarding into that, but we want to talk about racing extinction more. So, the, but the idea is like, make, you know, how do you scale up these issues? You know, a film, I was like what we did with the Cove, where 23,000 dolphins down to six. And I was thinking, okay, mass extinction event. How do you get that film out there and get people to see it? So I, I knew it was about scale. So we had the film at Sundance this last year, and we uh, licensed it to the, uh, the Discovery Channel. There's a reason we did it, because they were paying us a lot of money for a documentary. Uh, it was only, still only 30 cents on the dollar because you don't make a lot of money when you do documentaries. But, um, but they promised us a, a global audience. And they put it out in 220 countries and territories on a single day. And 36 million people saw it the first weekend. It's showing, again, I think either tonight or tomorrow, racing extinction. But you know, that 36 million is a, is a really good launch for a documentary. But what you need to do, though, is get it up to scale. It doesn't matter, like, if 36 million people see it, what you need is 10% or it's up to 16.5% of the population to see it before. That's the, the tipping point, what Ma Malcolm Gladwell talks in his book about. But you know, the science shows you might need as, as little as 10% of the people to have an unwavering belief in the truth, and then the rest of the population falls like dom dominoes. And what one little uh, section, when, when racing extinction, we had, we had um, premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival I, have to, I think it was like the year before last with this film, as a, and it was a rough cut. The, the, film, the Tribeca Film Festival, where I just got back from just 20 minutes ago, is, uh, is going on right now. But we did a rough cut screening. In that, in that screening, what we do is we, we tr were trying to alert the world that there's a mass extinction going on. And Ban Ki-moon, uh, who's the Secretary General of the United Nations, allowed us, the day before the big climate march in New York, allowed us to use their building as these, for these projections to give endangered species a, a, a voice. We took the 39-story Secretariat building, used that for like a big canvas, and then used the, the General Assembly building, like it was like five IMAX screens together. We tiled about 16 to 30,000 lumen projectors together to do this, this huge projection event. But I'd always wanted, I, when I, I was just saying right before we got here that I usually stay at the Maritime Hotel right across the street. And Eric Good, who runs the hotel, saves endangered species, loves the work we do, and he always gives me the penthouse suite, which overlooks the Empire State Building. And I thought, I want to light up the Empire State Building with endangered species. And we had a scene in there that was Tony Malkin, who owns it, is a good friend of mine. And he said, well, Louis, if you can you know, get permission to do it, I'll let you use the building. 
And I've been trying for four years to light up the building. And you know, since what, you know, to the last two years of the Bloomberg administration. And I was, uh, I was at an event and, uh, with, right, right before the COP21. And uh, there was like 50 of the heads of organizations like the Sierra Club, Greenpeace, myself in the room over at Norman and Lynn Lear's house. Norman Lear is the most successful producer ever for television. And we had our, the, the first one I did, The Cove was sold at their house. We couldn't sell it at Sundance, you know, six years ago when we came out. But in that room were two people that, uh, the head of Lionsgate and Jeff Skoll from, uh, from, what's the big company, what's he do, PayPal? Uh, Jeff Skoll, help me out. You guys have to know who he is. Um, anyway, he runs participant media. Uh, they bought, they, 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 anyway, one, Lionsgate bought the film. Jeff Skold uh, runs participant me media, does outreach campaigns for films like ours. Said, you, if you buy the film, I'll do the outreach campaign. And so in that room, it was a very powerful room to me. That's like, that made my life go around. So five years later, now I'm sitting in this room with, you know, 50 of the heads of these organizations and five of the people down below Ban Ki-moon working on the environment before COP21. And Lynn says to me, uh, Louis, can you talk about your movie, Racing Extinction? And which was over at that point. We had the ending with the, um, the, uh, the UN in it, and I said, well, I, I don't want to talk about the movie so much, but what I've been trying to do to really end the movie is to uh, uh, light up the Empire State Building. Does anybody in this room know Bill de Blasio, you know, the mayor of New York? And Norman Lear, who's laying up against the wall, says, I know Bill. And he flies to New York the next day. It was like a Saturday at this house, and the next Wednesday, I get an email from Bill de Blasio saying, cool, how do we make this happen? And so right there, we've, we've got the wheels in place to, to light up the Empire State Building. Now, the problem was our distributor was like, you know what, Louis, the movie's good enough the way it is. You don't need to touch it. It's, it's, it's great. And it was a wonderful global ending to the film. And said, you know, it's August. You want, you want to do this? Everybody that's important in New York, in August, they're going to be gone. They're going to be in the Hamptons. They're going to be over in, you know, over in Europe. And on a Saturday night, none of the media is going to show up. Nobody can afford to have you know, uh, a cruise, you know, working overtime on a Saturday night. It'll be a non-event. We did it anyway. And we closed down traffic on Fifth Avenue. It was like, you know, taxis were stopping in the middle of the street with their fares and getting out and taking their cell phone pictures. You know, there was, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people on the street and on the rooftops, you know, shooting this. And what we, we didn't count on, we didn't even think about, is just the viral nature of everybody with a cell phone putting in on, you know, with their thousand friends on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. We became the top trending story on Facebook and Twitter for four days running. We had 939 million media impressions by Thursday. And, the, you know, the, it blew up, you know, and went the, the, this viral way that nobody ever expected. And then I thought, well, it can't get any bigger than that. We really hit it out of the park. And then the Pope calls. And the Pope wanted us to, uh, to say, right before, uh, he said, all this attention is going to be on Paris, but we need to keep the attention on you know, what's going on for the, for, for the environment so to, to get the leaders that are there to pay attention. And so he let us use the Vatican. You know, the, this is you know, St. You know, Peter's Cathedral as the backdrop for this uh, uh, do, do we have clips? We, can we show anything? Do we have anything queued up? Yeah, we do have the UN. The UN. Okay, well, uh, do you want to look at that? And then. Extinction. <laughs> it's a, you can get it on iTunes, Amazon, or you'd order it from Discovery. Um, I wish I had known it was to be this small of a group. I could have just brought them in my backpack. If you guys, you probably, you probably don't know what a DVD is anymore, do you? <laughs> but anyway, you can, you know, I, I'll get a dollar from you if you if you actually go buy the film. But um, we're doing a new ending right now that that'll include the the, the Vatican. But um, anyway, did you want to? Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> just wind me up. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, had, you had a list of questions there. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, so I've seen the film uh, several times already, and um, you know, it's incredibly powerful and moving, and the um, imagery is incredibly evocative, as as we've seen here. I was really surprised by some of the stats in the film. Like you said, I didn't know that much about um, about a current mass extinction event. I was really surprised, particularly by the six billion oysters that died overnight on the oyster farm, 70 million sharks that are killed every year for shark fin soup. Uh, did you know about these things as well, or were they discoveries for you too? Um, a lot of, th I didn't know about acidification. You know, um, so we're acidifying the ocean to the point where we're increasing at about 30% since the industrial era. era. That's uh, what, what happens when you lose, when, when by, at the current rate of acidification, this is the burning of fossil fuels, uh, about half to a third to half of all the carbon dioxide that released gets absorbed by the ocean. That creates carbonic acid. So anything with a carbon structure, plankton, coral reefs, start to dissolve. And that's what's going on right now. But at the current rates, by 2050, all, all coral reefs will be in a state of dissolve. State of dissolve by 2100, they'll be gone. I didn't know that. That was like, a, a, you know, horrific because trying to re reverse acidification is really tough because it's a, you know, it's a, we're changing the chemistry of the ocean at that level. And when you, you, you lose 25% of the species in the ocean, but there's a billion people that rely on coral reefs for food, sustenance, you know, recreation. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, I was, I was sitting in, the, at, at a, in, a, in a room at the Aspen uh, Ideas Festival with, you know, I, I just was taking off every, I was speaking there, but I just took off everything I could attend. I found myself in a room with, uh, Marvin Odom, who's the head of Shell Oil, and, and his half his board of directors, and the head of uh, Duke Energy and Southern Electric. This is like, I don't know. In my world, this is like you know the devils, you know. And I was in a, in a, in a, just just like this, a, a circular table. We're all having lunch, and Marvin says, "We have scientists looking out, you know, 50 years, and we're going to have to double our oil project, oil and gas production by then to meet the demand." I said. Marvin, we have scientists looking out 50 years, 500 years, five million years. If you burn all the oil and gas you want, we're not going to have you know coral reefs, you know, in the next, you know, for your children to enjoy. I said, how do you reconcile your short-term business interests for long-term economic environmental damage for a billion people that rely on a food source every generation? And he says, well, you know, uh, what do you do for your energy? And I said, I'm glad you asked. You know, I drive electric cars. They're powered by solar panels. My SUV is actually, a, my license plate on my electric car says VUS. It stands for Vehicle Using Sun. It's the opposite of an SUV. I power up my, my work and my home by solar energy. And he says, well, not everybody can afford that. And these people start, you know, talking among themselves again, and, you know, sort of hump humping. But there was only one woman in the room. And afterwards, she had a copy of the code, because she knows I'm going to this lunch. And she said, would you sign it for me? I said, what's, what's your name? And she goes, it was, it was Mrs. Odom. It was Marvin's wife. And I thought, OK, this is how we're going to get to the men, <laughs> is through, the, through the women who have a lot more innate passion, or compassion, I think, or their kids. And you know, I, I knew I, I had to make a movie that was going to, you know, maybe do an end around because you know you can sit there and, and talk among your shareholders, but one thing you can't ignore is your kids and your wife. You know, it's just it's just the way it is. Yeah, I read an article last year, um, many articles last year, actually saying that the melting of the polar ice caps or the Antarctic ice cap is now irreversible. When you hear things like that, it's kind of hard to keep hope. Um, so, you know, in, in the film, Racing Extinction, it does have a, a message of hope uh, with the Start One Thing campaign. Would you like to talk about that a little bit before we take yeah, some questions? Yeah, I mean, every, everybody, well, first of all, the movie's constructed so that if, if you're in the audience, you're thinking, I'm just one person. Everybody that we, we picked in this film is a game changer. They're doing stuff that's absolutely remarkable. Uh, you know, we, we take a, a, an electric car. We were going to build one. We thought, well, why build one when Elon Musk just built the best one? We go to visit him. This is a time when everybody thought he was going to go bankrupt. He thought he was going to go bankrupt. We were going to inter interview him in October, and he wrote back and said, Louis, can we wait till the end of this quarter? If I don't hit my numbers, I could go bankrupt. Said, sure, if you want, do whatever you want. It was photographed in, like three months later, four months later. The numbers were slightly better. Stock was at $34. And now it's like a 250. The the um, the new model that he's you know came out with uh, you know had more orders more uh, pre-orders than a it's the biggest biggest product sell in history in a single day bigger than the iPhone. So I mean change happens very very quickly. That's the cool thing. That's what should give us all hope. You know when I was walking up to the Tribeca Film Festival to get this award, I saw this. It was a picture from 1905 of Broadway of horse all these horse-drawn carriages on Broadway. 
if you that same photographer shot that same angle seven years later, you wouldn't have seen any horses. It would have all been cars. That's how fast life transforms, you know. And it, it's, it's, seven years is that magic number that where, th where things start to ramp up. Seven years ago, we were punching. There wasn't smartphones. That's when the first smartphone came out seven, eight years ago. We were punching the number one key to text six times to get a capital C. And now, I mean, I don't have to tell you guys what you can do with the, with the cell phone these days, but it's like the Swiss Army knife for our lives, right? We do everything with it. But that's, you know, that's seven years. But if you're 25 years old, that's maybe seeming like an eternity. But, you know, for me, I just, you know, just turned nearly 60. That's not that long. And so my hope is that you can get this film out there, get some of these, these disruptive ideas, like, you know, you don't need meat for nutrition and protein. In fact, in our film, we look at world's strongest guy. He's a vegan, nine-time world champion arm wrestler, Alexei Bavuda, a vegan, most accomplished ultra runner, male and female in the world, Scott Jerk. He just ran the Appalachian Trail, 22 days, double marathons a day, and running the Appalachian Trail, 46 days. And he does it on a vegan diet. Um, there's a reason, because it's cleaner, it's better for your system, it's healthier. You know, uh, we, we interview doctors, the uh, head of the, you know, uh, the U.S. Heart Association, and they're saying, look, you know, I, I had no study, no, no doctor has, you know, studies nutrition at all. He said we, we're inept to, to, to deal with the, the diseases. 80% of the diseases that we have are caused by what we eat. And you, you could talk about, you know, strokes, you know, heart, you know, heart conditions, you can talk about erectile dysfunction, it's all related to basically filling your, your body with animal fats that, that, fats that clog up your system. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a plumbing problem that we have, and it has to do with what we put in our mouth. One of the doctors told me, he said, I could, I could fix all the problems in America right now, most of them, by just wiring people's mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a disassociative relationship between what we're eating and what we think it's doing to our body. And I think so. You, you can, uh, you can. A vegan, uh, Sam Simon, the, the co-founder co of The Simpsons, told me that. I don't know if it's true or not, but he said a vegan driving a Hummer uses less energy than a meat eater on a bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, if you want to save the world, change your diet. Yeah, on uh, RacingExtinction.com, I saw that there's a um, Earth Day challenge. Or, or you're calling on people to participate, and uh, I've decided to do something I've been meaning to do for a long time, which is, which is to look into and start buying carbon offsets mm. for my travel. What about you? We, we, we did the same thing for the film. It takes, uh, you know, it's only like, the average person uh, in America um, consumes about, there's, burns about six to seven tons of, of carbon. So it's a lot of carbon, but you can offset it for as little as $20 by, you know, setting aside acreage and you know we, we do it in Ecuador we you know set aside acreage enough to office that the, the whole entire uh, travel and production for the movie um, and it's not that it's not that expensive we just you know you, you do some some basic math to, it took a um, you know when we did the cove the first film we didn't know about carbon offsets I had somebody spent three months doing it because we didn't have the tools back then and we it was a number it was like 646 tons of carbon we, we figured we used to make that film so we offset it by you know as much as we could by putting the you know solar panels and getting electric cars and then setting aside rainforest that's that's the easiest way to do it because rainforests get knocked down primarily for cows and what they're finding is if you leave it alone you can stitch back these these environments um, there's a lot of one of the big problems with extinction is that you fracture the environment and the, you know uh, populations can't you know breed across that and it's, you start to lose your, they can't sustain themselves so what we're doing is helping stitch back the rainforest so does anyone have any questions or an earth day challenge that they'd like to take up themselves we have a mic again yeah Thank you for coming. Um, is it on? Is it on? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you for coming here. Um, we hear a lot about these things every day. Like you mentioned, I, that uh, when it comes to kids and uh, wife, then we are more considered than um, that. It just occurred to me that oh yeah, when I go back to my house, uh, I think we are growing things on backyard and we think about like all right let's eat vegetarian mostly it's vegetarian cooking and uh, like let's pick organic stuff but when I'm here I just today in the lunch I picked whatever came first like oh this I didn't realize like whatever chicken fish whatever came in my plate I just I didn't quite um, 
it's, I'm more in my commercial mindset when I'm here. And when I go back, I'm more like long term and what will happen to my kids and family, that kind of a mindset. So I myself, I saw, oh, I'm two personalities now. <laughs> so um, how can you, now coming to the, the I like the hashtag, the, I followed follow that a bit, like one thing. Start with one I thing. I start with one thing. Uh, so I changed um, the laundry to be crystal balls, which are kind of bioceramics. They don't use um, detergents. Um, looking to bike in the summer, um, things one by one, remove the chemicals for the cleaning lady to instead use method or like uh, simple stuff like vinegar and soda, baking soda, and so on. Um, but I don't see like a good way to convince. I had to like trouble. I had a lot of trouble convincing people, like, hey, it's okay if it leaves a little bit of dirty thing on the floor. And my clean lady is not quite happy because she thinks like she's not doing a good job with vinegar and uh, baking soda. Others are not happy with washing the clothes. So where is that I can show them like, hey, you know, the incremental rewards when you set up a design doc to a manager in our job, uh, for example, as a software engineer. Managers want to see incremental returns. They don't want to see, hey, one year from now, you'll give something like that. Can you make it more quarterly? <laughs> At yeah. least something keeps coming. <laughs> well, I mean, um, you know, at the end of our film, you know, it shows the, 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 the result of one action you do. If you install, I mean, uh, in New York, you're probably not living in private homes, but if you, you can, to other parts of the country where you're living in homes, you know, you, you install solar panels. It's, it's the equivalent of taking a, a gasoline a uh, car off off the road and you know driving it a half halfway around the earth every year. Well, here um, we can actually choose our energy source through Con Ed. Uh, uh, you okay. can choose solar or wind. It's actually takes thirty seconds to sign up. Well, there you go. And you know, uh, deciding to be, you know, there's meatless Monday campaigns. There's you know, every every human, every American, you know, eats about an average of ten thousand animals in their lifetime. So you know, you think about. You know, you can look at it from an ethical point of view. You can look at it from a health point of view or an environmental point of view. You can win the, look at any of those critically. You can solve the day. You know, whether you decide to eat more of a plant-based diet for any of those reasons, it can be, uh, you, you can win that argument. So, uh, if you know, I, I keep on coming back. The simplest thing you can do is change your diet to more of a plant-based diet. But yeah, I mean, there's hopefully there's a, a thousand different ways that you guys will think of besides the obvious ones of how to how to say, but. You know, it's important to look at each action. I mean, I look at every person in this room as a, as a superhero. You have that potential. You're probably already doing it in other points of your life. When people say, what can I do? I say, well, the first thing I can say is not you should do this. It's like, who are you? What do you do? And try to use that talent to amplify the message to other people. I mean, you work at freaking Google. You're telling me what it's like. You can you can reach more people with that little laptop than you know a, a New York Times writer can you know t ten years ago. You know you could you know write a blog to tell the cleaning ladies of the world to you know <laughs> what the, the the difference of the, the you know you could figure out chemically how much uh, better it is for the environment, much better than I probably could. Uh, but I don't know who you are. I mean, everybody can do that. Think, okay, what am I really good at? You know, in my world, if you're a filmmaker, you make films about it. If you're a writer about race, if you're songs, uh, Michael Franti, the, so the, uh, the uh, singer for Spearhead, was been writing me the last couple of days. Wanted to, he's doing a song about it for Earth Day today. Um, it depends on who you are and what, you, what you're doing. Um, everybody has, you know, a massive amounts of underused talent. I think. Uh, question here. So one of the things you said we can do individually is to become vegetarians. And uh, you know, one parallel I saw was we've known for about 40 plus years that cigarettes can kill us and we still have plenty of people smoking cigarettes and that's such a individual, like if I keep doing this action, I'm going to die and there's still people doing it. And I was wondering, do we really have to rely on people to sort of break food, meat eating, which has become so culturally in intertwined. Do we need to rely on people to individually make that decision or are there other things we can do to help affect that change as opposed to waiting 50 years for people to really well, stop eating meat? If you want to, you know, I'm young, I'm old enough that I can remember that you, you, if you came to a, an office like this, you know, 30 years ago, you could see people smoking at their desk and polluting the air. Yes. You, 1997, I think, or 98, <coughs> was the last 
you know, smoking planes, commercial smoking planes in America. Uh, if you want to smoke at Google, you probably have to go outside and around the corner. I think there's going to be a time in the very near future where if you eat meat, it's going to be like you can do it, but outside around the corner with the smokers. <laughs> I mean, because environmentally, if you look at the impact of, you know, just like in California where they, you know, I forget what, what it is, something like, is it 5,000 gallons of water for a kilo of meat? It's something, it's, it's in the thousands of gallons per pound for, you know, to raise meat and when, there's a, when there's a water shortage going on. I mean, it would be like, you know, standing in a shower for three days so you can have your hamburger. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's really out of balance what we think. And, and most of the, like, a lot of the crops are for, you know, almonds, 1.1 gallons for, to raise an almond because they flood the fields. It's very inefficient. Somebody in this room could probably figure out how to do it more efficiently. A lot of the alfalfa that's grown in California is the alfalfa is exported to China where they feed cows. I mean, think of the energy loss there. We're exporting our water and our energy and things that we could, you know, Plant, plants we could be eating, not alfalfa, but other things we could be using for ourselves. It's just this, this horrible exchange of energy that I mean, everybody should, should see it. The environmentalists, they see it, and they're harping on it. But yeah, the, you know, the Surgeon General's smoking was hazardous to your health was 40 years ago. Um, but now you, you need to, two things. You need to ch change public perception, and you need to do government legislation. And I can't talk about it right now, but there's a really big country, a huge one, and it's not the United States that's going to announce next month the, to reduce half their, the meat consumption of a very big country. And that's going to be a mandate that people have to follow. You know, they'll do it, they'll, they'll cut out subsidies. So it's, it's happening. At a, uh, the leadership is, is coming from other countries other than America. We are, I mean, I've traveled around the world quite a bit. You guys probably do too. I mean, we are looked at as like this. It, you're, you're innovators. You're, you're different than the rest of the population of, of America. But the rest of you know, America, we are not. And we are looked at as like the, the, the fools of the world. We are. Because of, we're, we're the slowest to get you know, the carbon problem. If you go to, you know, to Europe and Germany, I mean, the 30 percent of their energy is done with, with alternative energy. Now they're export. And people said, they have more installed solar than, than we do. And we have the so same solar foot footprint here uh, as, as like Seattle has the same solar footprint as, uh, as, as Germany. And they're producing energy so cheaply that they're exporting it to Poland for, they're giving it away, like one cent a kilowatt. You know, so and here we still hear this diatribe, oh, solar is too expensive. No, it isn't. That's a, a vestige of, you know, a campaign by the fossil fuel companies to say it's not practical. The fossil fuel companies also told us that, you know, the, the divestment campaigns weren't going to work. You know, a couple of you know, college kids getting, you know, Harvard and Stanford to, you know, reduce their fossil fuel, uh, you know, uh, footprint in their, in their endowments wasn't going to affect their bottom line. Peabody Coal went, out, went bankrupt last month, the biggest coal company in the world. You know, so it's happening. We're bonding together, but you need both. You need legislation. You need to, you know, the, the Warren Buffett, I used to like that guy, but I hate him now because he runs a company in Nevada that just made it almost, uh, made it almost impossible to get solar because he has a, 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 a fossil fuel company. He, wants, he, he made it almost impossible for somebody in Nevada, which is like all sun and desert, to put up solar panels and get paid for it from the state, you know, to, to, to sell back the energy. And they're doing this, they're, that this is their business model. They know they can't do it on a national level, so they're going state by state and trying to make the right thing to do very difficult for, for well-meaning people. So we need, to, we need to fight them and also get legislation to make it easy for people to do the right thing. And also, you know, the impact of a film is really powerful. I mean, just, you know, we don't have, we just have anecdotal stuff, but I was a judge at Sundance this last year. And uh, a guy, I was you know, coming out of the bathroom rushing to get my seat, and some guy says, oh, you know, I just saw Racing Extinction uh, last year. It changed my life. I said, how so? He said, well, I had uh, two ca big cattle, cattle operations. I just got rid of both of them. And you know, so films are a really powerful tool. Tell your friends to see the film. It's, it's really important because, you know, you can sit there and talk about to your cleaning lady about, you know, the importance of the environment, you know, that you know, it's really important that what you do around the house. But you see a film like Racing Extinction or... I don't know, Chasing Ice or these, any other the environmental films that are out there, you don't have to explain it anymore. Buy them a copy. Give it to them as, you know, with your, with your weekly, bi-weekly check or whatever. You know, and, and then you, one thing with, about a, uh, Rick O'Berry, who was the, the hero in the first movie, did The Cove. He was a, the guy that captured and trained the five female dolphins that collectively played the part of Flipper. He told me that, Louis, the film, The Cove, was the best thing that ever happened to him. I said, why? He says, because he never has to explain to anybody 
what the problem is. Because you go to a dolphin show and you see the dolphins are smiling and laughing and the kids are having fun. What's the problem? But the film shows you that you know the dolphin has a, an eternal smile, even when his head's chopped off and sitting on the you know on the, the slaughterhouse floor, it's still smiling. You know, there's they have they have bigger brains than us. They're more more sentient. You know, the neurons that are associated with sentient neurons are more familiar. Little they, they hang out in family pods like orcas their entire life with their mother. They're and when you start to see a film like that that explains the, what the problem is, it's like instead of you know trying to explain it and spending you know an hour or two at a lecture. Now he's got tens of millions of people around the country, around the world, that understand the problem, and it's just a matter of going country to country to try to close these, these businesses down. Same thing with the film. If you can you know, get the film out there, you know, Discovery did a great job of, of getting the film out there, but we're still not at that 10% level. 36 million people worldwide is not that big. We need to do that in America. You know, so, so tell your friends about the film. Hi, thank you for being here and thanks for all your great work. Um, I think it's a very sobering statistics that are, you're sharing and that um, I think something like 50% of greenhouse gases are produced by animal agriculture. It's um, really terrible. So I really appreciate your call to action to, for people to take up vegetarian vegan diets as one way to kind of combat this thing that's going on. My question is why do you think, and I watched very closely the COP21 and now the US Dietary Guidelines which came out in 2015 both of which seem to completely ignore the issue of animal agriculture. I mean, it wasn't even brought up or mentioned. Sustainability wasn't even an afterthought for the dietary guidelines. So I'm wondering what you think is kind of the impetus to have our politicians and leaders talking about these things openly. Yeah, I mean, whenever you talk about dietary concerns, you have the, the lobbyists go in really hard with their, the, the lobbyists go to the politicians and try to get the language dumbed down. Uh, when the first, I remember when the planet, when the the, the the guidelines came out five or six years ago about okay, eggs, dairy, it's a real problem. Milk should not be in the you know in the food pyramid, at all. Yeah. You know they this got crucified. You know the, it, it it was too, it was too big of a problem politically. Um, the information is still there. You know the UN uh, the UN, UN came out with uh, you know got the guidelines for for agriculture and you know it's it called the long shadow yeah. of agriculture. And um, said we have to reduce our, our consumption. The 50%, you know, if, if you look at, you know, it, it's I think it's 14.5% of the equivalent of tailpipe emissions. So it's it's more than the, cons the consuming of meat for you know, in America for consumption is more than that of all the tailpipe emissions of all the industries you know that, that burn fossil fuels, planes, trains, automobiles. That's for certain. At least 14.5%. 50% is probably aggressive, but. The thing is, we know that this is the one thing that we can do right away to, to turn the dials down. But this is an area where, where we have to do it, um, you know, in, internally. We we showed the film in Bogota, Colombia, last uh, just several months ago, and the day after, this is a, a pretty heavy meat-eating country. Uh, the day after, the, uh, the students got together and met with the chancellor, and they he agreed to put more of a vegan menu on. On, you know, with there are several thousand students there, and this this is the kind of change we need. You know, we know that in America we we're, we don't work on a national level as much. I've testified against SeaWorld for the other film, but what we're doing statewide is, you could you could have a a container load of shark fins that are legal to to possess, sell, or distribute in any way in Washington State, but. It, that, that container, if it's not open, could go on to Oregon or uh, Idaho or somewhere else, transport by truck and get dissem disseminated. And the, the U.S. Customs officials says there's nothing we can do about it. We just made it illegal to e import them into the into the docks, and we're doing that in California and in Oregon. We're, well, Texas is the first southern state that we had to implement the law, so we're working. Um, with legislations, but but on a statewide basis, sort of like the same way that Warren Buffett does it with his with his minions, his bastards, and we're and we're, we're trying to close them down so we can take you know the, the, the Seattle is the third largest port in America, and that's that's a I mean, this make it very very difficult to in fact it wasn't just shark fins there was ten uh, you know I, there's ivory rhino horns you know uh, pangolin um, there's t ten species so you know. You, we can do it, and we work together. It doesn't take much to get a referendum these days. It doesn't, you know, the, people talk about these petitions, and you, know, you get them all the time. And people say they don't work. We killed SeaWorld with petitions. You know, we got Willie Nelson, bare naked ladies, you know, these ten musical acts out of twelve to to stop performing at SeaWorld. 
we, Richard Bloom, who is a representative from the state that I live in now, California, came out with a law that, you know, it was just a, a first salvo. It was just an idea. The law was that it was going to stop breeding of orcas in, of, of dolphins in, in California. That law, coupled with uh, my organization, my, I run the Oceanic Preservation Society, with six people. We bought copies of Blackfish, another film about dolphins and, and orcas. We bought uh, copies of Blackfish in the Cove, and we gave them to all the shareholders of the 10 major investment firms of SeaWorld. That coupled with Richard Bloom's law, proposed law, caused the, the stock to crash a billion dollars in a single day, and they haven't recovered since. And that's just a half, it wasn't just our organization, we worked with other organizations. That was a great movie, Blackfish. But together, we can do incredible things. Uh, we're, we're trying to get it illegal to bring animal parts, body parts from, for trophies from Africa to America. And UPS buckled with 167,000 um, members on the petition. We're working right now, this week, today, with, Federal, uh, with FedEx to do the same thing. Uh, we showed that you know, we could illegally transport shark fins to states uh, you know, using you know, their system. And the, you know, we, we, we did it. We, we photographed it. We had their people from Federal Express um, complicit with helping us, uh, showing us how we could avoid federal law by shipping with them. And so that, that, that is what, you know, they're head of marketing right now. We will release it, you know, probably today or tomorrow. And, you know, it's, if, they, if they don't, you know, buckle, we'll, just, uh, we'll, we'll go public with it and start a, a petition. So it doesn't take 160,000 petitions is nothing, you know, to, to get these companies to change law. Um, all it takes is, you know, getting people together, you know, getting people to understand that, you know, taking the, the, the 15 seconds, the five seconds it takes to, to sign a, a petition really helps, you know, sign and share. So who, I guess going back to my question, who would you petition and how to, you know, create 100 million new vegans in the United States tomorrow? Is, is I, I'm working on a film, you know, the, the, the film, the, the one I'm working on with, with James and Susie Cameron, uh, we're working on that. We're trying to get Arnold Schwarzenegger as a, 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 a executive producer as well, uh, Lee Cushing. For the richest guy in Asia, he's also an executive producer. We'll get the film out there. You know, I work on I work on that issue every day, uh, with the idea that it won't, it doesn't happen overnight. It's going to happen with this film. And we want to get the film distributed, and then you know, at some point maybe release it for free. The, you know, the, the problem with people I say like in the environmental movement, they say, well, if you're you know, all you care about is money, you have to release it for free. It's really expensive to do these movies. Racing Extinction was a an eight nine million dollar movie. We sold it for three million. It's, I probably can't even tell those figures, just cut that from the record. <laughs> but, it's, uh, um, but it's an expensive movie to give away. And you know, I've, I've got, I've sold my house and I've got you know, $700,000 of my own money. And I'm not a rich guy. Everything I own is in that film. And people say, why don't you give it away? It was like, you know what? I've got to eat, I've got insurance to pay. You know, my, you know, if I go on a Google on a, on a laptop, I've got to pay for that laptop. They're not giving it away to me. It says, it, it, life is expensive, and I've got crews that need to get paid. And, you know, it's like, it, you can't give away art just because it's, a, you know, it's well-intentioned. Um, and I've got, you know, sometimes we have investors that need to get paid. You know, so, but there's a, a scale. You know, we're, we're very conscious that we want to hit that 10 to 16.5% number. No matter how it happens, and you know, we uh, we didn't sell the. I remember we, uh, we had a deal to sell the Cove in China, and some of you said, "Oh, they're only going to offer you thirty thousand dollars." I said, "Fine, we're going to reach. They're, they're going to reach a half a billion people in China." We didn't do it, and then I can remember we went to China about a year later, and like the people that were with my team were signing autographs on the street. They recognize him from the movie. The, 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 somebody had pirated the movie in, Can, in Cantonese and Mandarin, and it was like every school kid of you know 15 to 25 years old had seen the Cove, and they were like, now there's celebrities on the streets. But it's because it went viral because we didn't sell it. Somebody just took it, you know, under the you know said, let's just I like this movie, let's just yeah. rip it, and you know it, it, it went viral. But you know, for me, it's like at some point I don't you know I don't care about the money so much. I just want to. You get it out there and solve the issue, so we can, you know, we can go on to something else. There's always going to be another problem to solve. Thank you. Are there any other questions? All right, we got one over there. I think this will be probably the last one. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, 
Thanks for being here. Um, you flew to, well, you were undercover in China for racing uh, extinction, extinction, excuse me. Could you tell us about uh, maybe the most uh, horrifying moment that you experienced there? In China? Right. Or Hong Kong. Oh, well, Hong Kong. Well, it's actually, we were in, a, in, in Guangzhou, and they had the illegal wildlife markets there. And this is, uh, it had been shut down twice that year, and it keeps on moving. It's, there's so much demand, it keeps on springing up, even though people face jail. So you, you go there at like 3 in the morning, and people are selling, you know, just about everything you can imagine. A lot of illegal wildlife, or a lot of wildlife that we wouldn't eat in America. But just the same, just the screams and the horrors of these animals being, you know, put in the cages or being killed was just, you know, blocks and blocks and blocks. It would be like the meat district here. Like, imagine every shop, like you go to the Chelsea Market, and there's 15 of them that size, and they're all, like, selling, you know, snakes and dangerous snakes and endangered birds, all kinds of, you know, farm animals, but, you know, things that, I don't know, dogs, cats, rats, they're all being eaten. And it was just like everything that had a heartbeat, if, including insects and larvae, was being sold there. And there was some, something just really disturbing about that, you know, that it was just done so openly. And you know what, uh, I, I, what, in 1986 I was doing a story for Fortune magazine on the biggest independently owned cattle ranches in America and I went to one that was so big in Oklahoma that they had their own slaughterhouse and that convinced me to become, I wasn't a vegetarian, I was a pescatarian, but, but I stopped eating things that walk right then and haven't since. It's, uh, when they kill these animals, they put a captive bolt to the skull. They're supposed to kill them instantly, but it's an assembly line. They're just, you know, they did 500 a day, 500 you know, cows a day in this one little small facility. And they rip the skin off, and they hang it upside down. And it's supposed to be dead as they're, you know, people are shaving parts of it off and putting it into different bins and stuff. And I remember this, this cow was hanging upside down. It's supposed to be dead, and it was looking at me and following me as it went around in this conveyor belt, and I realized it was still alive. Part of it was still conscious, and I thought, at that point, I don't want to be part of it. Now, I've made a conscious effort, but when you see that the scale that was being done, it was amazing. Or there's a rooftop in Hong Kong that we went to, and you know, it was like seven pallets deep of shark fins, and it was spread out all over this, this roof overlooking Hong Kong har Harbor. And you know, each shark has like seven fins to it, and you see these little baby ones. You saw, it, I, 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 dove all over the world and you, you know you see you, every time you go back to a place you see less and less sharks and it was because of the demand for shark fins now if you haven't seen the cove or the sorry racing extinction what you realize is that one of the guys in our film uh, had photographed a live shark fin like what they do is they a lot of the sharks they, they just cut off the fins and throw the shark back to, to die it's like you know being with his arms cut, like basically it's all its appendage just cut off and a shark needs to, it doesn't grow them back, it, doesn't, it, it needs to swim to, to breathe. It, it needs the you know, water rush, rushing by its gills. So these animals are just left the, the, to die in the bottom. And one of the guys in our movie had filmed this. That film went viral in, uh, in China with a, a PSA that Yao Ming, the basketball player, did. And that the airing of that film was, see, it was seen by more than a billion people in Asia. And that, along with, with legislation, uh, it's now illegal to serve shark, shark fin at banquets, uh, at government banquets in China. Uh, that one PSA helped reduce the, the demand for shark fin soup by 70%. That's the power of imagery. And that's one of the themes running through racing extinction is that imagery is very powerful. I mean, that's why we do films. That's why I was a photographer. I was like, you know, we, we, I, I did it to, to try to change the world. You know, that's, that's why I was working. When I, I, the first story I did for National Geographic was a story on on garbage and recycling. This is, I started it in 1981, and people weren't talking about recycling back then. Now there's recycling, you know, in my hotel room. But I was on the vanguard of people. But at Geographic, when we, we came out with that story, uh, we had 15 million people saw the magazine at that point. It was about the second biggest subscription magazine in the world. And uh, it had a pass around rate of about three to four people would see each magazine. So you could hit that. Malcolm Gladwell number, that magic 16%, just by virtue of getting one article out there that people see. Now, I'm not saying that 50% of the population became you know, recyclers overnight, but it became that first salvo. The, the, the research shows that if you want to get a, a movie scene in, in America, people need to hear it six or seven times before they'll actually go see it. So that means they have to have a strong word of mouth. 
Uh, it has to, you have to have your, the celebrity that's associated with the movie on a, on a cover of a magazine that you adore. You, you see bus stop ads and billboards and they, they blow it out there. A $250, $250 million movie will have a hundred, hundred and fifty million dollars to it. If it's a really a bomb, they'll throw another fifty to hundred million dollars at it because they know if they don't hit those numbers the first weekend or two before people figure out that's a piece of crap, they won't see it. We don't, you know, as f documentary filmmakers, we don't have that. But what we do is we have good ideas. We can, you know, light up the UN or the, you know, the um, Empire State Building or the Vatican. I wish that was my idea. But what, what we're doing now is saying, okay, the film is out there, but we're still, we still work on COVID issues six years later. Um, recently, SeaWorld, just because of all the pressure we put on it, they announced that they weren't going to do captive breeding anymore. They're stopping all their, their orca programs. And that's because of, you know, uh, Blackfish, the code. The, the, the executive producer of Blackfish uh, was inspired to become a, a vegan by seeing the cove. And, she's, and she had never done a movie before because of, but it was because of the cove that she you know, put the money into to Blackfish. So there's like a, a, a reciprocal effect of doing one good thing that can, can really go viral. Um, and that's why, I, I mean, I, I, I worked for National Geographic over the course of about 18 years. I did, I don't know, 13, 14 stories for them. Uh, and I rarely saw, I can remember one, one time watching somebody actually see my movie like on a plane, or my, my, my story on a plane, and he flipped through that, you know, this, took me a year and a half to do the story, he flipped through it and like, you know, as fast as you could flip through a magazine. And it was heartbreaking, but with a film, you got 90 minutes to change people's hearts. And that's, a, that's an extraordinary amount of time these days. You guys probably know more than I do. I mean, people say that people don't spend more than, you know, a couple, of, you can't have a, a a YouTube that's going to last more than a couple of minutes. I don't know. I think people have a propensity to, I mean, I binge watch, you know, um, House of Cards when it comes out. You know, <laughs> I'll do it in one weekend. You know, I think if you have a good story to tell, people will, have, will endure just about anything. And the trick that you have with environmentalists is how do you make a good story? And what we try to do is we try to make a story that is really entertaining. You know, Rolling Stone said that, you know, the, like I said, it's a, the code was a cross between the Bourne Identity and Flipper. This, you know, this racing extinction is really a result of, for me, of watching too many Jacques Cousteau specials and James Bond movies as a kid. You know, we have a Tesla that we tricked out. You know, we wanted to make a, this Bond car, so we have, you know, electroluminescent paint job. We use it for, like, you know, for getaways. Uh, we have a disappearing license plate. We have a forward-looking infrared that comes out of the front on a, on a gimbal so we can see carbon dioxide in real time. We have a 16,000 lumen projector that comes out of the back of the hatch on a robotic arm so we can project on skyscrapers in real time. And, you know, the, the, the car is, like, you know, freaking amazing. But um, we knew that we had to have some sort of, like, uh, a hook in there so that if a kid of a certain age saw the, the film, they'd say, you got to, you know, at least go see the car. <laughs> you might not get, you know, they might not... Completely understand that they'll get the exposition, they'll get the, the story on the way to seeing the car. But there's all sorts of like interesting characters in this film that are hopefully, you know, hook people into the film. There's a lot going on in this one little 90-minute sequence. But 90 minutes is a, enough time to actually change the DNA. Somebody should do a, a, some research on it. But I think that, that you know we we used to read books and get changed. You know, we're not reading books in mass anymore, but we're just watching films. And we're watching episodic television, you know, by the, the buckets full. But if you can make a film that changes people's hearts, we can change their behavior. I know that. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank for you, coming. everybody. Yeah. Appreciate it. Sure. And uh, yeah, be sure to check out Racing Extinction. It's available yeah. online, and it's uh, check out the website racingextinction.com for local local viewings. Great. Thank you all. Cheers.